go randomly. Somebody said that both of us were nodding during meditation. <laughs> is, this, is this an exploration of the state between wakefulness and dreaming? Or, <laughs> <laughs> judge other people, just judge your own practice. (laughs) (laughs) What is sharp awareness? I feel like my awareness is a bit dull. Is that awareness at all? How can I sharpen my awareness? Um, Yeah. There... different aspects to being fully aware. One is um, being clear. So so the mind is not muddled. You're not confused. Um, Another aspect is uh, quickness of mind. That you're the mind is very quick at noticing objects. Um, when you're doing, particularly when you're doing a formal vipassana meditation, you should be striving for that sharp, quick clarity of. We talked about um, precision of noting, of noticing. That's that's very important. That it isn't just a kind of a fuzziness there, but you're you're noticing specific objects. And the mind can get very, very quick. Uh, uh, if you can have experiences in meditation where the mind is very rapidly noticing objects. Um, that's, uh, that's what you should be moving towards. So you're not noticing things after they've already come and gone sort of retroactively but you're noticing them on their first horizon and the mic can get very quick and very sharp uh, someone asked about dreaming I have been having dreams where I break precepts or pursue sensual gratification sensual gratification or otherwise behave unskillfully. Sometimes I lose the dream. It can have a sense of consciously making choices which will lead to a harmful outcome. Is there a problem here? Is there something I can learn from this? Uh, first of all, first thing is don't, it's not a big, con- it's not a you know major concern uh, because there's no karma made in dreaming. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, realm. But you know, having said that, uh, if you are able to lose a dream, you can use that skillfully, um, and just uh, using it to uh, pursue uh, sense pleasures is not a very skillful use of it. It's kind of a waste of that um, that phenomenon. Uh, one thing that you can try if you find yourself lucidly dreaming is uh, try doing walking meditation in the dream. That's a, that's a useful thing to try. Um, a good way, uh, I'll give you a little uh, tip on a, a useful way to induce lucid dreaming, if you, if you want to try uh, to explore that, is uh, several times during the day, in your waking state during the day, if, 
five, six, seven times during the day. Just stop for a few moments, whatever you're doing. Men just stop mentally and still carry on physically what you're doing. But mentally ask yourself, am I awake or dreaming at this moment? And ask yourself that question seriously and make a habit of it. And after a week or so, usually then that question will arise in your dream state. Am I, am I awake or dreaming? And if, if you're able to answer, oh, I'm dreaming, then you remain lucidly dreaming. It wakes you up in the dream, so to speak. It was a period of time I was experimenting with lucid dreaming quite a bit, and I made it one of the projects I did was if I encountered any other persons in the dream, I asked them, are you uh, actually just a figment of my own mind? Or are you some kind of independent entity? Or maybe even another dreamer meeting me here? And I never got a straight answer. kind of psycho babble gobbledygook. <laughs> I find it hard to maintain good posture while meditating, a tendency to slouch um, and to constantly concentrate to keep good posture. Uh, does that, is that counterintuitive to the effort to do nothing? How do I reconcile these views? Uh, good posture is um, uh, quite important for developing good mindfulness that's a foundation it's worth making the effort to um, to try and and uh, develop a, a good good uh, meditation posture the, the critical thing is having the um, the back upright uh, uh, not rigid not like a stiff but um, comfortably comfortably upright Imagine as it's this analogy given in the Vasudhi Maga for um, this is imagine that your vertebrae of your spine are, are like a pile of coins, and um, this, if they are leaning over to one side or the other, they'll topple over. But if the center of gravity is going right down the middle, then um, it's quite solid. Uh, it's it's of less importance. Other aspects of posture are less important. So you know, don't think you have to sit full lotus or um, hold your hands in a specific mudra or so on. Although those things can be can have a benefit. Um, uh, if you can sit either half lotus or full lotus, it's it's very stable if it's not if you're not stressing your uh, legs particularly your knee joints you know, got to be somewhat careful with that I have over the years I've known two people one was a lay woman and one was a monk who uh, seriously injured their knee joint by sitting full lotus and when pain arose, just bearing through it, just ignoring it and continuing. And then they ended up tearing a ligament in their in their knee. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you know, it's something you have to train towards gradually. And um, you, uh, if you can sit like that, it's very stable. But don't, but only use it for meditation if you're comfortable. If it's not a strain to do it, and it's not worth it. Uh, but as I say, keeping the back upright is, is good for wakefulness. Um, one thing you can you can do is uh, uh, training yourself to sit in meditation is to sit with something on your head, a small object like a matchbox or something. So it, so if you start to slump, you'll fall off. Morning right away. Uh, there was one I heard about this one monastery in Thailand where the abbot was um, 
becoming an, uh, upset with his uh, the young monks and the novices all falling asleep in morning meditation. So he he made the practice. Everybody had to put a matchbox on their head, and if it fell off, you didn't get any any food that day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a stop to it. <laughs> no. no, here's... Okay, I'll just read this as it's written. How do I cultivate prophecy, capitalize on the future before it ha happens, and cultivate presence to master the arts of seduction and persuasion? <laughs> 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 why, do you, why do you want to go there and just, just worldly dhammas? That's not, that's, not the, that's not what we meditate for. You know, we're meditating to uh, become liberated, to realize the unconditioned. And if you're um, seeking these kind of powers and uh, control others with your mind and so on, then you're... Uh, you're just getting yourself into more trouble. <laughs> it's not uh, not a wise pursuit. This is a similar one. <laughs> uh, how can the craving for romantic or sexual gratification be controlled or overcome? Um, uh, Transcending sensuality is not um, not simple and not 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 easily done, not done all at once. But to um, get yourself uh, to try and get the mind beyond sensuality is, is something I want to talk about tomorrow. And is the levels of consciousness. And uh, if you're caught in sense desire, sensuality, sexual desire, particularly, you're, you're caught in the lower band of consciousness, sense desire realm consciousness. And this is the place where there's the most suffering. It's the most uh, complex and the most difficult, the stickiest. Um, uh, one uh, contemplation is useful is to contemplate the, the foulness of the body contemplate 32 parts of the body or contemplate rotting corpses this is, uh, these are traditional meditations loosen the grip of sensuality on the mind There's a story in the there's a story in the, in the Pali Canon in the Vinaya texts about the uh, famous courtesan Ampabali that uh, was highly sought after by all the the noble youth of uh, of India and the kings would actually rival each other to have her set up her her uh, her place in in their town because if she was such a um, major tourist attraction, I guess. It's <laughs> uh, and when she died, the um, uh, the Buddha told the king, "Don't bury her just yet. Leave her, leave her for a month." <laughs> and then he had them uh, put her body in a cart and drag it through the town. Uh, this month-old corpse. To say, uh, who wants this body for a hundred kahapanas? Uh, you know, like a large sum of money. Uh, uh, nobody wanted it. 50 gahapanas, 20 gahapanas, all the way down to like a penny, and nobody wanted it. <laughs> so it's the, uh, you know, the, the nature of the body revealed. Uh, what does it mean to take refuge in the Sangha? Have you met Ajahn Charge and Mahabua or other famous masters? What were they like? What do you think of them as heroes? I'm not sure if hero worship is a good thing. What do you think? Um, 
taking refuge in the Sangha has, has any, any, all of the refuges have uh, different layers of meaning, levels of meaning. The um, traditional definition of, of a Sangha for the refuge is uh, it's not actually meant to be, to be the ordained Sangha, it's meant to be the Orion Sangha. The Orions are those who have attained to the unconditioned. <coughs> the the um, stream enters, uh, once returners, non returners, arahants. That's the Orion Sangha. That's the, uh, the noble Sangha. Um, and we take refuge in that uh, because that gives us confidence and, and hope that it's possible that there are beings on this earth who have realized the unconditioned. The word Sangha in um, Pali and uh, related languages, in, its, in a non-technical sense, in a broadest sense, it just means um, community. And it can be like any community. Um, but in the uh, use in the Pali Canon, Sangha has, again, a couple of meanings. We mentioned Orion Sangha. There's also the Sangha as an organization. It's the order, the organization of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Uh, it's like a corporate structure that continues through space and time. The sangha. And there's also mention of what they call the fourfold Sangha, which is bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen, and laywomen. So all Buddhists who, uh, all who follow the Buddhist path are included in that broadest definition of Sangha. Um, there's also a sense of Sangha as uh, your own community that you take refuge in, your own community that you're building here, in this, this center, and um, people who meditate together and under, under the guidance of uh, Bhante and uh, Bhante Sudaso and other other teachers that uh, this is uh, a Sangha and you can take refuge in. You can see that practical side of that in um, meditations you do in a group. You can support each other. You give each other kind of moral support. If it's difficult, you say, oh, well, you know, the, the rest of them are able to do it. I should think I should be able to as well. <coughs> Uh, I didn't. I did not really meet Ajahn Chah when I, I ordained in 1992. Um, he died the year before that in my novice year. I was a novice, and we did go and visit him and chant at his. Uh, but he was in a uh, basically an unconscious state at the time. He wasn't speaking or engaging with people. Um, and I did attend uh, a, a talk given by Mahabua and also by Buddha Dasa. So I have seen some of these these uh, these masters. Um, in both of those, uh, Ajahn Mahabua and Ajahn Buddha, I found very impressive. Uh, uh, and, and they, were quite, they were also quite different in their personas and the way they, they presented themselves. Uh, we have to be somewhat careful about um, you know, hero worship. I mean, it is good to have a... Uh, it is good to revere and respect these, these teachers and to have them as models and, and guides. Uh, but uh, you don't want to put all your all your um, devotion and faith into a, uh, a human, one human being, you, uh, in, in, the, in the end, in, in Theravada Buddhism, the uh, onus always falls on, on yourself. You have to liberate yourself. You have to do the practice. You, no one can magically liberate you. you know? um, we, uh, we in Pali, the word for uh, a teacher is sometimes used is kalyanamitta, good friend. Well, that's basically what a, a teacher is. Ajahn Chah 
himself said it, it, that uh, his way of teaching is he sees someone walking down the path and he's walking behind them watching them and uh, he sees if they start to stumble into the ditch on the right hand side he says go left go left and if they start to stumble in the ditch on the left hand side he says go right go right <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is said, do not try, when meditating or performing many other tasks, this brings ease. However, if we do not try, then where is the desire to do? Your thoughts on this matter. <coughs> yeah, this is a, uh, actually a very good question, um, because it brings up this kind of paradox of action of non-action. That... Um, if you want to perform any action, whether meditating or doing some uh, mundane task in uh, any kind of job of work or project or uh, anything you want to accomplish, there is a kind of perfection of, of doing through non-doing. And people who are into sports recognize this, like being in the zone. You, you're not... You're not, in a sense, uh, doing. You, you're not micromanaging what you're just kind of giving yourself into the activity. And there's a, a freedom and a perfection. There is a, you know, um, in Zen tradition, there is some emphasis on learning through, learning the uh, Dharma through. Uh, a, doing various kind of skills or crafts as a vehicle, such as archery or calligraphy. Uh, there, there's a, a book I looked at once that had that was speaking about Zen calligraphy, and it had a very interesting um, illustration. There was a picture of a Japanese character that had been drawn by a master, and then beside it was a uh, same character is drawn by a, uh, one of his advanced students. And you could see by looking at them, somehow you couldn't, it's hard to put your finger on it, but the master's character looked better. It was cleaner. <laughs> and, you know, uh, but then they had, below that, they had a, a like an ex, um, photographic expansion magnification of the end of the stroke and that was very revealing the one from the master the end of the stroke of the pen was sharp crisp absolutely crisp and the one from the student it was kind of fuzzy at the end and the explanation in the write-up said that the master was either making the stroke or not there was absolutely no hesitation there was no moment of sort of um, a little further, I don't know. <laughs> he's, just, he's making the stroke and he's not. You know, and that's like the perfection of action. You're just doing it without um, without the hesitation, with uh, you know, with this absolute clarity. <coughs> in the chitta, what benefit does that bring? How is this benefit related to Nibbana? Um, the benefit is that it clarifies everything. Uh, it's, it's the natural, it's actually the natural way of holding the mind. Uh, we're naturally 
gravitate towards the centering in the chitta unless we identify with the formations. You know, it, it, it takes energy to uh, make yourself confused and agitated. You know, you're, you're, by going out to this periphery of mind states, and you, you're dissipating your energy. If you're centered, then everything is clear and you're operating from this clear point. Um, in relation to Nibbana is is uh, not <coughs> um, it's not in itself Nibbana, but it is the the doorway is the gateway of realizing Nibbana is by uh, clearly seeing the nature of samsara, and then one can um, disengage from it. The process is described in different ways. There's a particular set of three uh, stages that the mind goes through. Um, uh, nibida, Viraga, Niroda. Uh, nibida is um, a word that's really impossible to translate, um, but it involves a kind of a, a disenchantment or a disengagement. We're ordinarily caught in samsara because every object that arises is full of either fear or fascination and we're caught in this process. This is like important drama going on here. You get engaged in it, caught in it, and keep feeding it. But if you practice this um, clear noting, noticing the phenomena objectively, and you're centered in the chitta and just watching the objects pass, then that fear and fascination begins to wear down. It wears thin because well, it's just more of the same, more of the same, more stuff, just variations on a theme. It's not nothing here to get, get really fussed about. And this kind of um, uh, weariness with samsara is the first thing first stage of disengaging from it is nibida. And then uh, that allows the mind to develop viraga, which is this passion. You know, it's this kind of passion for experience that drives samsara. And with nibida, then we can get past that passion and we can, uh, take away the mode of force that's driving the process. And then that leads to neuroda, which is cessation, which is the end of the process. The process stops, we disengage, we get off the train. We're, oh, you know, we're, and that's when we can experience the unconditioned. When we get off the merry-go-round. And this is, uh, this process is, is done by, through, through the, the means of knowing the mind, through the pasana. And that has the two aspects that we talked about, being centered in the chitta and clearly knowing the objects. These are two sides of the same coin. If you're centered in the chitta, then the objects will be evident. If you make an effort to really notice the, the objects, then you're going to be centered in the chitta. So it's really just two ways of talking about the same thing. What techniques allow one to peer into the afterlife and the astral planes? Okay. This is, this is a, another um, thing of, uh, thank you. Um, question about <coughs> craving and, and seeking out these sort of um, uh, fascinating experiences. That's not what the that's not what the Dhamma is, is about. We're not trying to do magic tricks or you know, secure to the crystal ball. We're trying to become wise and free. So it's really it's a huge waste of time and um, 
the, a diversion to be seeking after those kind of things. It's not in the end profitable. In noting meditation, if you're overwhelmed by the amount of stimuli, is it useful to focus on one kind of sensory input, i.e. sound, or is something else recommended? Um, I don't want to give a hard and fast you know, rule that applies in all cases, but in general, it's the, the practice should be uh, not to discriminate between the objects. So you treat sound, touch, thought, treat them all the same. Um, and uh, not to try and deliberately narrow the, um, the focus to one sense base. Although you can experiment with that kind of thing if you're working on a particular, you know, say, uh, for a particular reason you want to particularly investigate the nature of sound, then for a while you can just focus on sound. But if you're really developing Vipassana, you should always get back to that non-discriminatory, choiceless awareness. Like whatever presents itself to consciousness, that's the object. Um, and it can be at times, yeah, that you can have the, the sense of being overwhelmed by the rapidity of the objects. That's as the mind gets sharper, you see more and more objects before, and it might happen before the mind gets calm. This is one reason why it's good to practice samadhi meditation, uh, develop some inner space and calm, and then that'll allow you to have some ability to do vipassana more effectively because you're not overwhelmed by the stream of objects so much because the mind has more space and <coughs> calm. Uh, but if the mind, if you are experiencing that, you're doing Vipassana, you're trying to do the noting method and the stream of objects is just too much, you can't notice everything, then what's recommended, they call noting by groups. You just kind of, you try, you, until you can get it under control again, you step back from this really sharp focus and, and just notice, you know, you're overwhelmed by thoughts and thoughts or um, memories or whatever it might be. Just try and, and keep, a, keep a thread of <coughs> awareness going. You know? Something that, that can happen uh, I've seen it with some uh, people who, um, it often happens with people who do their first intensive retreat. They may have dabbled in meditation a little bit before, but then they do an intensive retreat. Some, somewhere around day three or four, they come and tell me, I think I'm going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one, one woman described it, I thought this was a really very apt description. She said, it's like there's uh, six or eight radios in my cabin and they're they're fading in and out from different stations all the time. <laughs> and it's, it's the, the, that's the way the mind is. And um, what's happening is not, you're not going crazy. You're just, this is the way your mind has been all along. You just haven't noticed it. You know? And uh, you don't, you don't want that. You don't like that. You, no, it's not pleasant. So let's try and calm it down uh, and this when you are actually noticing stuff then the mind does begin to calm down and if you're overwhelmed to that degree it can even be useful just to note every now and again confusion confusion uh, to try and keep a thread of the practice going and even that will allow things to calm down What's the difference between Chaitasaka and Sankara? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a question dealing with uh, uh, technical use of, of, of words. Uh, Chaitasaka is a word that is used um, in the Abhidhamma. I think it's exclusively found in the Abhidhamma. It means uh, 
uh, that which is associated with chitta is derived from like chitta is the knowing mind and chitasaka is uh, the adjuncts or the um, core risings of chitta uh, that which is with chitta and that includes all the other stuff in the mind all the other mental stuff so it includes sankaras but it also includes Vedana and Sanya which are the three mental aggregates other than Vijnana which is consciousness which is roughly equivalent to Chitta that's another whole discussion Chitta, the relationship of Chitta and Vijnana but um, the word Sankara has a different uh, slightly different meanings according to context in the broadest sense, sankara means conditioned object. So everything other than nibbana is a sankara. That's the broadest use of it. But it has a, n- a narrow technical use in as one category of mental phenomena, the sankaras. They, uh, that is, uh, the word means um, constructions, things that are made, built up. So it applies to all the kinds of thoughts and emotions and um, stuff that we do with our mind, complex structures that we build with our mind. They're all St. Carter's. So uh, the difference between Chittasaka and Sankara, um, if we're using Sankara in that narrower technical sense, then uh, it's a subcategory of Chittasaka. If I'm really sleepy during meditation, what should I do? Could I just go to sleep if I think that's more productive? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, this is a very common um, issue is uh, being sleepy in meditation. Very often when people begin to practice meditation seriously, the first issue they have is with pains in the body, getting comfortable sitting still, and it seems sometimes overwhelmingly bad. And after some time they get over that, they can finally sit with some ease and they immediately fall asleep. (laughs) 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 That's sort of the common common course of events. yeah, it's not not of any benefit if you're sleeping. Um, you got to try and learn to develop uh, wakefulness. We spoke about posture before. That's that's quite important. If you fi- find yourself being sleepy, to make an effort to you know, have really good posture. If you're quite wakeful and, and sharp, then the posture is not as important. It's not. You don't have to concern yourself with it. But if you're sleepy, you really need to put an emphasis on posture. Uh, other th- the other thing to do is um, to do more walking meditation. If you're sleepy, get up and, and walk. Uh, if you're really sleepy, you should try whatever you can to, to wake yourself up. Even if it's like splashing your face with cold water walking barefoot in the snow is a good one. But uh, anything you can do to kind of just kind of shock yourself into wakefulness is good. Um, it's generally not not good to you know, give in to it and go and have a nap. Unless the exception would be if you're actually physically exhausted, if you you know been uh, um, you know been working hard the day before, or just finish a long journey or whatever, then uh, you may need to take a, a nap. Uh, you should try and limit that in time to uh, uh, at the most forty minutes. It's a, it's a short better like 20 minutes um, if you 
And if you're on a retreat, you should limit your hours of sleep as much as you can. If you're on a long retreat, you're doing a lot of meditation all day, you don't you hardly need any sleep at all. You need to lie down and rest the body for a few hours, but you don't really need to you don't really need much sleep. Even possible to go days without any actual sleep. It's one of the worst, uh, one of the worst things you can do on a, for your meditation is oversleeping. How to eliminate fear. Um, the more you realize emptiness of, of self the more fearless you become that's really the, the most important thing uh, uh, fear comes from an identification with the self and a feeling of threat to the self that I'm going to lose what I have I'm going to somehow be annihilated or destroyed or diminished but if you, if you see the emptiness of all phenomena, then there's nothing to gain, nothing to lose, and there's no fear. Um, and uh, an arahant is absolutely fearless. It's one of the definitions of an arahant is uh, abaya, no fear. But the more you can reduce that sense of self, the, more, uh, the less fear you will have. And there's a specific advice given by the Buddha about fear. If fear arises in while meditating, uh, one should not change the posture. So if fear arises while sitting, remain sitting until the fear passes. If it arises while walking, continue walking until the fear passes. So uh, you can understand that both literally and metaphorically. That you know, in a literal sense is a practical thing in that meditation, but metaphorically it also means don't run away from your fear. You know, face it down, go through it, come out the other side. <clears throat> One time when I was in, in Thailand, uh, Ajahn Pasano was giving a, a Dhamma talk on this theme about uh, fear and um, something that being uh, was a young monk at the time I, I had a question I asked him uh, um, would that apply to all the defilements just not changing the posture and he thought about it for a few seconds and he said nah, not really I, it would be like I'm going to continue lying here until this sloth and torpor passes <laughs> <laughs> I think that, yeah, the question of fear, I think that's the important thing is you know, go through to the other side, don't run away. This is something in, um, very important in our practice is that we have to have develop some kind of uh, element of courage because we're, we're essentially going into the unknown and we keep um, retreating back to the comfort of the known. We're never going to make any advance. My thoughts can be quite dark. Help. <laughs> uh, you can try countering countering dark thoughts with with light thoughts. I'm trying to deliberately bring up um, a counter. This is a, this is a a technique for dealing with any defilement is deliberately bring up a positive opposite. Like if you're thinking, uh, if you, this is an example often given is if you're thinking uh, thoughts of ill will, anger about somebody, you know, thinking that so and so is, oh, he did something wrong and I you know, really hate that guy, he bugs me. 
<laughs> and you, you try to bring up to your mind good things that he's done. And if you can't think of any examples, then just imagine him as a little baby. You know, or one time he was a little helpless baby. Uh, you know, try and counter the negative with the positive. You know, bring something up to mind that'll counter that, that darkness. It seems that the practice of being the knowing could reinforce the belief I am the knowing. How do we uproot this form of asmi mana? Yeah, you gotta not fall into that identification, and this is why I made some remarks about emptiness, voidness of the knowing. It's not a self. There's no one doing the knowing. It's just there's just the knowing, and. Um, uh, if you're if you're imagining that to be a a self, then you're not you're not seeing clearly. The idea of a of a self is um, we have to understand you know, the Buddhist teachings also in context of ancient India philosophical systems of ancient India. There was the idea of the Atman. Uh, this is probably the um, dominant religious position or philosophical position before the Buddha was the idea that there's an imperishable, eternal, unchanging aspect or element to human beings. Um, one of these texts describes it as, uh, as you, when you die and are reborn, it's like a man getting up in the morning and getting dressed in a fresh suit of clothes. Uh, so there's, a, there's an imperishable self that moves from life to life. It's unchanging essence. And then the, Buddha, the Buddha denied that, rejected that idea, and he taught anatta, not self, or Sanskrit is anatman, but uh, not self. That you can't find anywhere an imperishable unchanging essence and if we if we look at the if we center ourselves in the chitta we realize that that's that's changing moment by moment there's nothing permanent fixed there it's taking different fresh objects every moment and it it is essentially defined by its relationship to the objects so it, it's constantly uh, coming into being in relationship to an object. You know, Abhi, if you take the Abhidhamma analysis, it talks about the chitta as a momentary phenomenon. It arises for a moment in relationship to an object. And that particular process exists in a stream. Uh, it's, not, it's not a thing. Uh, part of the problem we have um, in talking about it and understanding it is that we're forced by the nature of human language to use nouns to talk about these things. And that's true whether we're talking in English or Pali or Thai or whatever. You know, we have to say chitta and use a noun or consciousness and use a noun. Whereas that, and that it gives, a, that, that gives you a kind of a implied idea that there's a thing that you can point to and define. There isn't. It's just it's a process. There's, there's really just the knowing. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing there to identify with. And if, if you make a self out of it, you're misunderstanding it. What is the difference between the knowing method of a pasana and the body scan method as taught by Uba Kin or Gwenka. Do they differ in technique or produce the same result? Is one form more effective than the other? Also, is cultivation of jhanas necessary for stream entry? Um, 
I'm not as familiar with the Goyenka method. I do, I know of it in theory. I've not ever you know, formally taken instruction in Goyenka. Uh, as far as I can see from my, no I've known many people who have followed that. It does seem to be an effective method. <coughs> and I, um, I don't know if, uh, if we can say one is better than the other. This is something that historically has been specialty of Burma is the development of Vipassana techniques. And there have been many, many that never made it to the West that we never hear about. But uh, the ones that have become popular in the West are primarily Mahasi Sayada, which I spoke about today, and the Goyenka method, which is based on scanning the body and, and focusing in on sensations in the body. I think the intention of all these Vipassana techniques is the same, is to access that state of mind of clear knowing, non-identification. But this is really, Vipassana is not really, it's best understood not as a meditation, but as a state of mind, a way of holding the mind. And the meditations are methods for getting there. And it may be that, that um, particular method works best for some individuals and other individuals uh, would not find it very helpful and could find another meditation better for them. So it may be in part a, um, to say one's better than the other universally I think is not possible. We have to uh, find what works for us and often I think in, in in practice, it's um, uh, we get the we get instruction in the meditation that we're karmically suited for. Uh, just whatever comes into our life, that's probably the correct thing for us. Um, is cultivation of John and necessary for stream entry? Uh, there's a couple of uh, ways to approach that. Um, in theory, in strict theory, yes, it is. Uh, jhana must precede stream entry. And the, when the Buddha spoke about paths to awakening, and he, there's a few variations, but the one he seemed to speak about the most is going through the jhanas and then uh, on emergence from jhana, taking the... Uh, emergence from jhana as an object of insight and realizing stream entry. Um, but there's also mention of a, a bare insight path, which means you know insight without prior jhana work. It's not really expanded on in the suttas, it's just mentioned. And um, it's been uh, in uh, some of these Burmese traditions, like the Mahasi tradition, they don't put much emphasis on jhana, and it's often called a bare insight path. But if you read uh, Mahasi Sayadaw's writings, he, what he talks about is that the mind will, uh, prior to attaining stream entry, will momentarily co coalesce into jhana. And that the degree of samadhi required even to do the vipassana at a high level is almost equivalent to a jhana. And then, and then at the at the last moment before attaining stream entry, the mind has a momentary jhana in that stream entry. Um, so I think that I don't think there's any negative to developing jhana. Uh, and some modern uh, modern commentators and um, uh, downplay jhana, or else are actually critical of it as a waste of time or as uh, 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 counterproductive in some way or you, sometimes you hear people say that it it can be seductive, you can get sort of a hooked on jhana and not go any further. I don't think that's really true if you have the right, right view. If you understand, if you've got the theory and you understand this is jhana, this is not enlightenment, then you're not going to get trapped there. What can happen with people who have not had that instruction, they don't know, they can mistake jhana for enlightenment and, and remain there.
I found that Thai Chitta meditation produced similar effects in me, more typical Samadhi meditation. Not bliss, uh, sukha, piti factors, but the calm or non-wavering. It almost felt like the chitta was the object not being wavered from, the object not being wavered from, uh, stuck to with chara or maybe the equanimity. Can you comment? Especially in the context of the Thai forest, I gems like to say uh, the samatha will pass the distinction is a bit silly. Um, I don't know if they say it's silly, but they do. It is, and this is also another characteristic of the Thai tradition, is there's some de-emphasis on um, the distinction. Uh, Ajahn Chah would uh, talk about uh, samadhi makes wisdom, wisdom makes samadhi, and talk about going back and forth between the two in a natural way. Um, th th there are two aspects of a full of a full uh, full on meditation or a full on practice is, the, is samatha and vipassana um, and in, uh, in in some traditions the, the, there's a very sharp distinction made between the two uh, in, in the Thai in the Thai forest tradition it's less clear distinction is de-emphasized. And I think this questioner, you know, is, comes close to expressing the reason, one of the, or one of the major reasons for that is that um, centering yourself in the, in the chitta is itself a kind of, it does have a, 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 a samatha effect. And it, it, it's very calming and spacious and um, uh, has that, that clarity, you know, but it allows. It's different from jhana in that it's not. Uh, it's not absolutely fixated on a on a single object, and it allows the mind to investigate and to see the nature of reality. Since the tranquil knowing part of the mind is separate from the changing object of what it is aware, in what ways is it, is it impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self? Yeah, that, that's that's a good question because the the chitta is not um, is not some uh, you know permanent, perfect uh, abiding. It's a part of the process of mind. Uh, it is, in a, in a sense, you could say it's, it's pure because it's not, it's so simple, it's so immediate, it's not defiled or purified, it just experiences, it's all it does. So this is one reason why centering yourself there is, is you know, productive, because you're not caught in complications. But it is... Uh, Impermanent in the sense that it's, it's momentary, it's changing all the time because it's taking different objects all the time. So there's a, um, a different flavor to the chitta in each moment. And in fact, it only exists, according to Abhidhamma, the way the Abhidhamma talks about it, it only exists for a moment. They talk about mind moments of chitta. So there's only, it only exists for a moment and it's followed by another chitta in an unbroken stream of cause and effect. Um, it's, uh, it's unsatisfactory because uh, it's uh, uh, constantly being um, uh, in relationship to, to objects. So it's like incomplete in its own self. Has, it has to exist in, in relationship to an object. And uh, it's not self because it's empty. There's no substance there. There's nothing you can 
hold or weigh or define. It's just it's just a, a void process. So the three characteristics do still apply to chitta. It's not some kind of perfect thing outside of the, 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 the laws of Dhamma. What's the difference between non-dual awareness and nirvana? Uh, I, got, I, I don't really know how to answer that because I don't have a clear I don't have a clear idea of what they mean by non-dual awareness uh, that's a concept from Vedanta um, and from what I have heard speaking to people it does sound somewhat like like our idea of Nibbana or the unconditioned but I'm not I'm not quite sure they understand it in the same way we do. Do you have any knowledge of that? Um, I'm only aware of how uh, non-duality is talked about in the Zen context. I'm not familiar with how it's talked about in Vedanta. Okay. Uh, yeah, the way that uh, non-duality is talked about does sound a lot like the perception of Nibbana. Uh, breaking down of distinctions of existence and non-existence. Yeah. If I really desire to stop meditating when I am meditating, what should I do? Keep meditating. <laughs> if I get very angry at meditation when I'm meditating, what should I do? <laughs> uh, well, that's kind of... Uh, well, you could reflect that that's kind of silly. <laughs> How can you be angry at uh, uh, meditation? It's, and it's not a... It's not a person or a thing. <laughs> What's there to be angry at? <laughs> How do these practices lead to a realization of impermanence, emptiness, and not self? Yeah, that's exactly what they supposed to lead to. <laughs> uh, exactly that. Um, it comes from from observing the objects of consciousness in an objective way, then we clearly see that each one is uh, empty, impermanent, dependently arisen, unsatisfactory, suffering. You know. There's the three characteristics are given as, as um, dukkha, anicca, anatta, suffering or unsatisfactory or incomplete or whatever, uh, impermanent and void. But there's also a longer list of 40 attributes of all dhammas that are expansion of that. Where's that found? In uh, Suri Magha is one place. I think it originally maybe comes from the Dhamma Sangyani. I'm not sure. But it's uh, I know it's in the um, in the insight section towards the end of the Suri Magha. Yeah. Um, so uh, if we're looking at these objects of consciousness momentarily, we see this if we, if we have this real dispassion, if we're not getting engaged in them, then we see that they're just, okay, they're, that's just another one, empty, impermanent, suffering phenomenon. Uh, um, we miss that in ordinary consciousness because we, we, we're driven by desire. And this is kind of the root, I would say it's the root addiction, is what keeps us going in samsara is the mind wanting to take an object and wanting to satisfy itself with an object. And it's like this fool's game. It's like the next object is, okay, this one's a piece of crap, but this next one, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> and you keep going after that next shiny thing. And uh, if you don't clearly see it, you keep fooling yourself for a long time, you know, for lifetimes and lifetimes. You're trying with, with the insight meditation, you're, you're stepping back, you're not allowing yourself to get passionately engaged in the objects. You're not frightened by the bad ones and you're not fascinated by the pretty ones. You're just, this is just an object. It's just empty, it's impermanent, <laughs> imperfect. Okay, next one, same thing. 
<laughs> and this is where the nibbida comes in. There's a weariness in the mind, right? Because the uh, it's just more of the same, more of the same, more of the same. It's like the fascination of the stuff goes away, and then you get this passion. And when the uh, it's taken to that stage, that leads to complete cessation. The process just stops because you're not feeding it anymore. Now, samsara, I've compared samsara to like a kaleidoscope. A kaleidoscope, you use this kid's toy like a telescope, and you look at it, and you turn it, and there's some mirrors and some colored glass, and it, and you see all these pretty mandala-like patterns. And there's like an endless variation you can see. Uh, but if you break a uh, kaleidoscope to examine its inner workings, it's just some colored glass and some mirrors, right? So samsara is just basically made out of three pieces of colored glass, red, green, and blue. This impermanent suffering and not self. And they just rearrange in endless patterns to create all the wondrous phenomena of samsara, all the terrible and wonderful things of samsara. They're just really rearrangements of those same elements. And, uh, it, if you can clearly see that this passion becomes evident to you, and then the, the fascination with samsara wears off. So I left this now for the end. This, this essay. This, this, well, it's like four related questions. And it's... Uh, uh, I don't know sure I pronounce it. Sri... Nisargadatta recommends that we concentrate on the sense of I am as discussed in the book of volume titled I am that. He says there is no quicker way to enlightenment. Eckhart Tolle says a similar thing. Is concentrating on chitta the same thing? Well, it's certainly a very different way of talking about it. The I am um, because in Buddhism we would say I am not. I am not that. Uh, it may it may lead to the same place in the end. Uh, um, I did read something once by um, Uspensky, who was a follower of Gurdjieff. Was a, who was a Russian, or actually he was Georgian actually, but he was, uh, lived in Russia. He was a, a Sufi master of the early 20th century. He was very famous and notorious. You know? And uh, Us uh, Us Uspensky was his most well-known student. And, um, for my taste, Uspensky's uh, writings are much more clear and sensible than Grigias. Uh, Uspensky talks about a practice of remembering that, that you're part of it, remembering that you are there. Which sounds on the surface, it sounds very un Buddhist, like it's kind of emphasizing the self. But when you understand what he's doing, it, I can, it makes sense that um, uh, you, you, when you're going about your ordinary day, you're walking the streets or you're at work or whatever, you tend to take in the objective field and deal with it, but you, you forget that you're there, you're part of it. And um, uh, if you remind yourself, is, is Ospensky's talking about this method of Gurdjieff, constantly reminding yourself that you're part of the, the scene. Like I'm sitting here looking out at all of you, and I can forget that you know there's there's this guy sitting here. That you remind yourself, okay, you're part of it. You really, uh, uh, that gives you a different, a more totality perspective on it. And he describes doing this practice in, uh, he's walking the streets in Copenhagen, trying to diligently do this practice. And um, walking into a, a t tobacconist to buy some pipe tobacco. And then he got lost in looking at the different brands. He got lost in the sensuality of the different flavors of tobacco and thinking about them, smelling them, and uh, forgot to do this practice. And then it was like 
half an hour later, when he's somewhere else, I came back to him because he, he, he should be remembering to be present. And he said, everything in between that, that period when he wasn't doing the practice, it seemed like a, a, a dimly remembered dream. He didn't seem like he was fully awake. Um, so the, the kind of the language we talk about things, like this um, Sri, Sri uh, Nisargadatta saying, I am, I am that. Uh, it sounds very un-Buddhist, but it might lead to this, it might lead to the same place um, if it's done properly. Uh, I would not, I don't relate to that myself. I, I'm pretty dyed in the wool, Theravada Buddhist, and I, I like to avoid any kind of identification with anything. Not seeing I am that, but just seeing that the chitta as knowing. Here's the knowing. Why do I have to identify that I am that? And here is the here is the knowing. Here is that. When we are concentrating on this, on the sense of being or knowing, what if a fairly strong pain comes? Do we ignore it or continue to concentrate on the sense of I am, the sense of being, knowing? Um, yeah, if you are really uh, centered in the knowing you can endure the pain, it's just an object, it's just another sensation. There's no reason to be dragged out from the center because there's a pain. It's just another sensation. Uh, then he's writing about the, um, the thing I said about seeing a, uh, seeing a bluebird as just a fabrication, uh, when we always use color and shape. Uh, he says, but can't the same thing be said for color and shape? Aren't these also mental fabrications? Uh, maybe if we really see with open mind, we don't see color and shape. Is that right? Why doesn't our heart see when he looks at a bluebird? Um, yeah, well, there's a uh, this, there's a, uh, a whole process going on to see a bluebird, and what. I was talking about is trying to distinguish the different pieces of that. That what I consciousness actually sees is just color and shape. And um, this is the uh, statement in Abhidhamma is also, I think, borne out by our, our modern understanding of how the eye and the uh, neural processes work. But we receive light waves, they strike the eye, and we have cones and rods in the eye that distinguish color and shape. And that's quite different from seeing a bluebird. You know, we see a, a bluebird shape that's blue, right? And um, uh, then the there's a process very closely following, and very intimately related with eye consciousness is perception, sanya. And that's tied in, and that's um, a more complex process and it's purely mental. Now the physical data has been received and known and now the mind works on that data and fabricates the image of a bird from the, the, the signal of, of blue shape fabricates the image of a bird, he recognizes the bird. And Sanya is, um, is a complex process and it's to some degree is educable. You can learn, like you can, you can study birds. Some people take a great interest, like bird watchers take a great interest in different species of birds. Whereas uh, someone who doesn't know much about birds might just see a brown bird and say that's a sparrow. But then Someone who's studied birds all the time, he sees a brown bird and says, oh, that's a, a New England uh, sparrow or whatever. <laughs> he recognizes the, recognizes the species, maybe the subspecies, the, the gender, you know, maybe even the, roughly the age. You know, the, this is all product of educated sanya. Right? 
Um, and then there's um, uh, the emotional response of Vedana, which is a feeling tone. You like blue. You like bluebirds, so you feel happy when you see one. That, that's a feeling tone. Uh, and then there's uh, mental formations, which is thinking about it. There's one uh, analogy. It's um, given in the city Magad about these different mental functions. It's kind of neat. Is a, a coin, a gold coin. A child holds a gold coin, an uneducated small child picks up the coin as this shiny bright object, pretty shiny disc. You know, an ordinary man, adult man, uh, uh, just a, a work man or you know, just a really common man picks up the coin and he knows this is a, a, a one kahapana coin, this is worth, you know, he knows roughly what it's worth what he can buy with it in the market. A coin dealer picks up the coin and he says, this is this is a, a Kahapana coin from Magadha. It was minted in the, in the reign of King Bimbasara. It's 97% uh, pure gold. It's worth 7% uh, more than a Kosala coin. Uh, and is, this is, um, the child is like eye perception, just sees the object without any dis distinguishing feature just sees color and shape and then the, the ordinary man is like um, perception uh, he recognizes what it is he knows it's a, a one cup up and a point but then the mental formations is like the coin dealer he can spin it out endlessly in details about it and so we, we take objects and we process them in, in this in this way yeah. so the one uh aspect of this is that the world we actually live in is a mental construct. Uh, it's something worth contemplating. Um, and there, if you get into Buddhist history, there's been different approaches to this problem. Uh, Theravada view, as I understand it from Abhidhamma and so on, is that the out, outside, the outer world, there is an outside world. There is a reality, but all we ever get from it are signals, sound and light and smell and so on. And then we construct a simulation of that that we actually live in. There have been schools of Buddhism that said there is no outside world, it's all just a mental fabrication, it's all just a dream. We're just all constantly dreaming this world. And there were some schools of Buddhism that held that position. So I think that's probably enough questions and answers. Um, unless uh, I can take a few more minutes, if there's any anything that comes out from what we've been talking about or um, the practices, anyone that want to verbally express a question? Yes. Um, I have two questions. One was uh, you said that there was uh, different layers of the refuge for the Buddha. And yes. The Dharma the Dharma, and yeah. then I forgot what the question was, well, what, what you said was about that, I remember the question being, if you have a specific way of dealing with things, fearlessness, there we go, yeah. you're fearless, and you, you go in the world being fearless, uh, with your principles, principles, but you're confronted with someone who does not accept the same thing that you do, how does fearless, how, how does being fearless help you in that situation? when they don't even recognize what it is that you're doing, or even you or your Yeah, business. yeah. Um, well, fearless, first thing I would say is that fearlessness is not the only quality that you require. You also need the wisdom and compassion. Right? So if you've got compassion and loving kindness, then that... Uh, by itself will disarm many hostile beings. They'll, they'll, uh, you know, animals and humans. But they'll, uh, they'll react to that. The, the, their own heart will soften. If you're coming from a place of pure love and compassion, then uh, 
uh, in many cases it will you know, just dissolve any hostility. Um, but there may be cases when, uh, and, and if you were a master like a Buddha, then it would work all the time. Like the Buddha, uh, when uh, a mad elephant charged the Buddha, he just stood his ground and offered loving kindness to the elephant, and the elephant was subdued. Um, but there'll be times when you know that doesn't work. There's some hostility coming your way, and it just it, it doesn't work. Then that's when you need wisdom. You have to deal with the situation in, in, in as much wisdom as you can. Um, which uh, uh, might mean avoiding that situation altogether. And that can be the you know just getting out of there. Uh, um, it might be. It might even in me, mean a. In some ex extreme cases, it might mean a judicious, judicious use of defensive violence. I guess even for our rules for monks is you know we're not allowed. You know it's a serious breach of the, the code to initiate violent action. But if we're attacked physically, we can use as much force as is required to escape. Right. So you know, so if, if someone's attacking you and you you hit him and he falls down, then there's there's that's self defense. But then if you kick him while he's down, <laughs> you, you've got you know you've crossed the line. <laughs> so, so yeah, I would say that's the you know the kind of the, the things that are required: loving kindness, compassion. Fearlessness and wisdom, and you can deal with any any situation. Yes, my mind was blown all the way off by your three pieces of glass and the kaleidoscope oh, yeah. explanation. Okay. Amazing. The three pieces again are—is it the anger, green, illusion? No, no, no. It's um, uh, impermanence, suffering, and not self. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was doing the second meditation, I noticed that at one point that I was in kind of a very pleasant, calm state, um, and then later on I noticed I could kind of nudge myself into that state, and I was yeah. wondering if that was appropriate or inappropriate. Um, well... I, I can't give a hard answer to that. I think it, it depends. Um, it should be. It, it should feel. It should feel uh, pleasant in the sense of being peaceful and calm. And I mean that that's the state you're trying to get at. But if you're just indulging in pleasant feelings, then you're kind of you're kind of missing the the point of it. Um, you can use that. That sense of a pleasant abiding as a uh, as a sign that you're that you're centered and that that, it, that it's that it's on that it's working, but it's not you know to be sought after for its own sake. Would the intentionality itself um, become a hindrance? Like if I if I intentionally put myself there. Is that contrary to the meditation method? Is that something um, that would later then I wouldn't be able it wouldn't have rise naturally because of the intentionality? Yeah, I think it's subtle. It depends on like if you're if you're primarily identifying with or, or seeking out the pleasant feeling, then it then it's you're you're subtly off, you know, you're not you're missing it. But um, if you're recognizing that Pleasant abiding as a sign that you're all you're you're properly centered, and then you can have the intentionality to try and center yourself by clicking into that that state, and then, then, it's, then you are doing it properly. Mm -hmm. What is jhana? Jhana yes. is. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that some more tomorrow. That's one of the themes tomorrow. But just say briefly, uh, it's um, 
a meditative state where the mind is reaches stillness on a single object. So it's a meditation that uh, we develop. We usually use in, in our tradition really the number of practices, but probably the most common is to use the breath. Use the physical sensation of breathing and then the mind, you try and train the mind not to move off of that, just to stay with the breath. And then the mind becomes very still and clear and, and uh, non-wavering. And then when it's completely locked in to the one object, that's jhana. really stop perception anyway. Uh, but you're trying to understand or clearly see the stages in the process. And as far as thinking goes, yeah, you can actually, for periods of time, you can actually quiet thinking down altogether. Um, you can notice the intention to think before you think. If you can do that, then you, the mind becomes very, very quiet. Because every now and again you feel an intention start to bubble up and you, don't, you notice it clearly and you don't follow it. So no thought comes. And if I'm already caught up in thought, should yeah. I do concentration or should I just do like... Well, if you're trying to do the vipassana and you get caught up in thoughts, then just keep noticing thoughts. And notice the process. This is a, 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 a tricky thing, is you, but uh, you're trying to notice the, the process, not the content. Mm. Don't take an interest in the content of the thought, but notice the process of thinking. That's the way to disengage from it. In my day to day life, I've been. Uh, Noticing, sort of, I've, I've been noticing the liking that comes with seeing pleasing objects. Yeah. In particular, there's a dullness that comes by on when I see my cat. Like, I'll see my cat, and then I'll be like, oh, he's really soft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, and there's, in my household, there's a whole social thing surrounding that of how much we think our cat is soft and how lovely that is. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, like, if you had any thoughts on how I could, uh, cultivate the awareness before and during? Um. Um, well, you could try some, uh, noticing, uh, clearly noticing that, that process. Like, like, first there's the visual impact of the cat. And it's just color and shape again, right? And then the mind has perception of cat, and this is my cat, this is his, you know, whatever its name is, you know, it's his, his specific cat. And then there's associated um, uh, feeling, you feel happy because you like the cat. You know? And then this mental formations come up, like, right? oh, that cat's so soft, that's a, that's a mental formation. So it's a whole, if you're just trying to clarify the, the process, so, so it's not, you know, automatic. It doesn't just kind of run, run down automatically. You're, you're making it conscious, and you begin to get uh, some distance from it. So I think better. I think I like to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh,